uh, so good evening everybody uh, so we begin this session um our first speaker is uh, juza thingna um who is going to speak about uh, degenerated luvillians and controlling transport um and please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions and uh, you can also put your questions in the chat box uh, so you can get started juza thank you so much manas for the kind introduction and let me take this opportunity to thank our organizers to arrange for such a wonderful event both bhavani and manas so as manas already introduced me i am juza i am a young scientist fellow working at the center for theoretical physics of complex systems this is the institute for basic science in dejon in south korea and uh, i'll be talking about degenerative lubilins and controlling transport and uh, like normal research this work was not done by myself but i had many amazing collaborators along the way jungyun han he is my phd at pcs uh, daniel manzano a long time collaborator and jian shu chao from mit another long time collaborator so let me get started with the outline where i'll first introduce the notion of symmetries in open quantum systems and uh, i'll try to motivate what these symmetries are and how they can be slightly different from standard hamiltonian cases and uh, in order to illustrate how these symmetries can be useful i'll take some simple examples and show how the uh, dynamics of the system can be reduced with the help of these symmetries so i'll take two simple examples of a minimal model and a benzene ring it turn, the problem turns out to be quite complicated once you start going to more complex systems and obtaining the non equilibrium steady states is not always as simple as it seems with these symmetries involved so i'll talk about this a little bit and i'll try to focus on a computationally friendly approach that would help us get these non equilibrium steady states and then in the final part of my talk um it's about the uses of these symmetries and how one can use these symmetries in some sort of device applications so basically controlling transport and i'll finally summarize okay so uh, when i'm talking throughout this talk about open quantum systems these are the kind of setups i have in mind where i have a bath on the left a bath on the right and some hamiltonian system in the middle and the system that i'll be considering will be hermitian so there'll be no non hermitian uh, physics in the system itself but the reduced dynamics would be governed by a non hermitian lubillian as it is generally the case with uh, these open systems um i'll stick to one formulation which is known as a lindblad quantum master equation and what this describes is it describes the reduced density matrix of the system so your rho is the density matrix of just my system alone which consists of a coherent evolution plus some dissipator and this dissipator has a very specific form where these lk's are called as uh, lindblad jump operators and due to the structure of this dissipator the density matrix or the reduced density matrix has some very specific properties uh, the most important property is that uh, it is completely positive which means that my density matrix can be written in terms of certain krauss operators your mj are the krauss operators and this ensures that my density matrix is always a positive um, operator which makes a statistical interpretation possible from the density matrix this equation also ensures that uh, my density matrix is trace preserving and it is hermitian so given this basic framework uh i can equivalently rewrite that uh quantum master equation which was a lindblad quantum master equation in this sort of shorthand notation where this calligraphic l that i have here is what i'll refer to as the lubillian now when i'm talking about symmetries in these open quantum systems there can be two kinds uh one in which you can have a symmetry super operator which i denote here as calligraphic pn that commutes with uh, the lubillian and if this happens just like in standard uh, quantum mechanics if you have a symmetry operator that commutes with the hamiltonian you can block diagonalize the hamiltonian here you basically block diagonalize the lubillian in this case but in open quantum systems you can have another uh, interesting scenario 
in which you can have a symmetry operator living in the Hilbert space of the system itself. And if the symmetry operator commutes with the Hamiltonian and the Lindblad jump operators, then also it would mean that there is some super operator uh, such that it commutes with the Lovellian. So a strong symmetry condition that I have here is a much, much stronger condition than the weak one. Um, such strong conditions do not appear in just closed Hamiltonian systems. And in both cases, due to these symmetries, due to the block diagonalization of the Lovellian, what you can see is that the dynamics of the system will be restricted to each block. So if you start in a specific block, your dynamics is restricted to that block. And more crucially for open systems, what this would also imply is that uh, there could be the existence of multiple steady states in such kind of scenarios. Okay. So if I look at uh, the spectrum of the Lovellian, this already starts indicating a lot of interesting properties now. Again, going back to my previous equation where I had rho dot is equal to the Lovellian acting on rho, I can use a spectral decomposition and this Lovellian, if I express this as a matrix, uh, this is clearly non-Hermitian. So it has left and right eigen uh, vectors. And using the left and right eigenvectors of the Lovellian, what I can do is I can find the spectral decomposition of rho. These eigenvalues will decide how my dynamics occur. And most importantly, you will have zero, zero eigenvalue. Uh, when I say zero, zero, I mean the real and imaginary part of the eigenvalues, both are zero. And this corresponds to the steady state solution that we would normally expect from such Lindblad or master equations. In case of symmetries, you can have multiple zero, zero eigenvalues, or you could have even situations in which the real part of the eigenvalue is zero, but the imaginary part is finite. Even these would be asymptotic state solutions, but they would be actually oscillating. So they would, they would not decay down to a specific non-equilibrium steady state, but it would be asymptotic oscillating solution. And of course, all these other points here, these are all the transient uh, transients basically, which will get erased over time. Okay, so given this notion of symmetries, um, it's at this stage quite mathematical. Let me take some simple examples to explain uh, what, what I mean by this and how they can be useful in certain ways. So the first, Extremely simple example is that of a non-equilibrium again set up where I have a left bath and a right bath. And my system now consists of four sites. So this is what a condensed matter physicist would call a tight binding Hamiltonian for the system. So you have the on-site energies epsilon and then you have the hopping terms, which I denote as T and its nearest neighbor hopping as you can see here. So this forms a nice ring. And in order to describe the open uh, aspect, I will choose the Lindblad jump operators in this particular form where I have a pumping and a dumping operator from the left and a pumping and a dumping operator from the right. So the zero state is sort of the global ground state. And then you have basically hopping from the zero to one and year from three to zero kind of a, a transition occurring. In this kind of a setup, one can easily show that strong symmetries exist. And the strong symmetry operator, uh, as I've written down here, indicates basically that if I take the system and exchange two and four, basically nothing changes. And that you can very well see from this figure itself, that if I draw a line along the axis of one and three, and along this sort of do a mirror symmetry of two and four, nothing changes. My system exactly remains the same. So this is nothing but the strong symmetry operator that I've indicated by pi here at the bottom. Okay, now how do I use this? Well, uh, it's quite simple actually, and it goes in the same spirit as, that, uh, as what we would do for Hamiltonian systems. So we do a basis transformation and we go into the basis of the symmetry operator. So initially I had my, sorry, I go one slide back again. Initially I had these states which were ket i and uh, yeah, which was zero, one, two, three, four. And now I go to a tilde basis, which is basically the basis of the symmetry operator. 
And you can actually decompose this entire basis into three uh, parts. One is simply the ground state. Then there is a symmetric subspace. So this contains only of the symmetric uh, eigenvectors. And then there's an anti-symmetric subspace, which is four tilde. Now, if I transform my Lindblad equation that I had earlier into this particular basis, what I find is that uh, the ground state has certain um, decay. The symmetric subspace, the master equation corresponding to the symmetric subspace has a certain coherent evolution plus a decay part, whereas the anti-symmetric subspace specifically is a decoherence-free subspace. So your rho dot AA is simply zero. Now, a decoherence subspace means that there is no effect of the bath on this particular subspace. So if I start in the state, which is the anti-symmetric state, I will always remain in that. And the bath is not going to affect it in any way. If I start in any of the symmetric states, my bath will affect it, and which is basically indicated by these Lindblad jump operators, and it will go into some non-equilibrium steady state. Uh, so, uh, Jusa, uh, yeah. uh, Bij Bijay, can I ask you a question? Go ahead, Bijay, please, uh, of so, course. Yeah, so for the symmetric state, it's surprising that uh, this two plus four somehow, although not directly coupled to the bath, but they still can talk. I mean, they can still get coupled via the Lindbladian, although two minus four is not, so it's kind of, it's That's not right. surprising. No, I mean, uh, so, okay, let me just go back one slide. So, of course, everything is talking to everything because there are interactions between one, two, and one, four, so on and so forth, right? So, yeah. everything is talking to the bath in, in the original site representation, as I would call it. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, the whole thing is about the transformation of bases. And you are mm -hmm. right in some way. It is not immediately obvious what will talk to what once you make the transformation. So in these kind of systems, you can sort of predict what might happen because you know these symmetry operators, but in more complex scenarios, it becomes a complete nightmare actually. So yeah, okay. uh, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I it, is, it is a bit surprising that uh, one of them talks and one of them doesn't talk right, from right. the site basis point of view. But since I know the symmetry operator, to me, it is no, no longer that surprising. Right. Uh, so okay. th th that's exactly the point I want to try to make. As long as you know these symmetry operators, things right. become clear. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, uh, yeah. So I have one more uh, I have one question. Uh, so the thing is, uh, uh, to find this symmetry operator itself is quite a difficult task, right? I mean, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, also, how do you know that you have not missed uh, further symmetries or... Uh, absolutely. Or... Right, right. Spot on. You, you are absolutely correct, Manas. And um, I, I will come to this in a, in a computational sort of a way of how, how one goes about doing this. But you're spot on. Calculating symmetry operators is extremely difficult. And not just that. Um, so these are still strong symmetries we are talking about where right. they live in the Hilbert space of the system. Right. You could have weak symmetries, which are nearly impossible to find. So okay. um, a lot right. of this is basically just framework uh, in terms of a nice theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. uh, translating it to real systems is a different ball game altogether, I would say. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I also ask a question, please? Sure, Samana, please go ahead. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, um, when you say that the uh, when you say that this particular state uh, evolves free from the bath, mm -hmm. do you mean it in the sense? Do you mean that it it only it has no influence from the jump operators, or do you do you mean it's entirely um, it's entirely decoupled from uh, your tight binding bath? Does so my question make sense? Okay, well, let me, let me just make one comment, maybe that, that explains the thing to you. So it, at least in the Lindblad equation that I have, right, um, the jump operator contains all information about the bath. So when I say it is basically um, not coupled or decoherence-free, 
What I mean is that, of course, it does not have any influence of the jump operator. It does not have influence of the bar. But in the next example that you'll see, which is benzene, so here, actually, my decoherence-free subspace, rho dot AA, is basically zero. So there's no, not even a um, sort of free evolution associated here or a coherent evolution. But in the benzene, you'll see just coherent evolution and no dissipative part to it. Okay. So um, I don't know if this fully answers your question, Samana, but... Uh, um, yeah, maybe. Thank you. All right. Maybe things become a bit more clearer as I go along. Okay. So this is what I would call a decoherence-free subspace, which uh, does not talk to the bot. So there's uh, no connection to a Lindblad jump operator. And um, if I look at the steady states, as I was saying, you always have one steady state, which is basically the anti-symmetric state. So this is what I indicate by row one, where psi is nothing but my anti-symmetric state. So this is a pure dark state. And uh, those of you coming from either quantum optics or you know, quantum effects and biology kind of a background, uh, we know that these dark states are also zero current carrying states. This little piece of information might become important towards more towards the end of the talk, but let's keep this in mind at the moment. So these are just some pretty pictures to uh, sort of give you what these states are. And uh, most importantly, and um, you can actually get, because you know these symmetry operators, you're actually reducing the problem. Uh, so if I look at the previous problem, I had four sites and from a master equation perspective, this would mean diagonalizing a 16 by 16 matrix. Uh, if I look at the Louvillian, which is a 16 by 16 matrix. Uh, in general, this is not that simple, but due to the presence of these symmetries and because of the fact that we know uh, you can decompose into different subspaces, you can actually find these steady states analytically in this case. So one of the studies, one of the non-equilibrium steady states. So since we have a non-equilibrium, this can be obtained analytically and it has a certain structure. So what I plot here in, uh, in this first left-hand side panel is the real part. This is the imaginary part and this is the dark state. So uh, the indexing is in the actual side basis. So zero, one, two, three, four. These are the basically site indexes. Okay. Let me quickly then go on to my next example which is that of a benzene ring. So um, I basically add two more sites to this entire problem, stick to the same type binding Hamiltonian, uh, jumping with uh, jump T. The Lindblad operators are also of similar nature. So I have basically a ground state and jump between zero and one and zero and four, both on the left and the right bots. And now uh, you have a strong symmetry operator again. Yeah, and now uh, similar to our previous example of this foresight model, you can immediately see that the axis along one four is the symmetric axis. So basically I can flip everything. So I can exchange two with six and three with five and everything remains the same. And that's exactly what my strong symmetry operator again does. It basically flips two with six and three with five and keeps everything else the same. Uh, yeah. Please. So, so if I ask, so even interchanging two and three would also give me the same thing, right? No. So two and three would not give me the same thing because it's non-equilibrium. So there's, the, you can think of some kind of a gradient, you know, okay. in in this uh, setup. So two and no. three are not equivalent. But two and three and six and five together with flipping the buses will do it. No. That's right. That's true. That's absolutely true. So I have for that I have to flip the bots as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, user. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, so I have a sort of question. So in the sense that sure. when you have a ring uh, with two opposite sides attached to bars, so and if you just uh, sort of go to the normal modes of that ring, there will be sort of a couple of normal modes which have nodes on the sides where the bars are attached. So are you sort of talking of those things in a way? Uh, so. Uh, Archak, I think, right? Um, yeah. So no, um, this is a bit too special. So I, I think some of us who come from also background with these, you know, um, non-interacting models, uh, normal modes, non-equilibrium Green's function kind of approaches or path integral approaches, uh, please be a bit careful here that um, 
these the the magic is all in this jump operators i see so there is not a one to one correspondence with a non interacting system although you know one might think oh look my system is non interacting but my system bath coupling that's yeah. no longer linear okay and that is where the magic lies in these lindler jump operators i see so i mean those uh, the so the kind of uh, normal modes that will have a node on those sites i mean uh, those still couple to these lindler operators yes okay those will right so just to quickly uh, point yeah. like so here when you say that this coupling is non linear this jump operator seems to indicate some kind of bilinear coupling no is this or am i just uh, is it so okay so the the point here is um if i if i take a non interacting problem right uh -huh. i can go into the single particle subspace right but the single particle always contains one state and so the tight binding hamiltonian that i have here Uh -huh. this is like in the single particle subspace right. Right. right right but this never contains the global ground state it never right. contains zero okay so when i even attach a bath with bilinear coupling mm -hmm. what i have is basically single particle subspace interacting with the bath mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't have connection between the single particle and the zero particle subspace okay and that's what the lindlar jump operators do here actually so in this sense they are a bit special that uh, they are breaking this sort of um, non interacting nature of the whole problem okay perfect thanks yeah. okay all right so um, you have the strong symmetry operator as i said that exchanges these and then uh, i can do the same sort of game once again where i transform and go into the basis of my symmetry operator and as i was just mentioning to savana earlier that uh, you you get the ground state again you get an equation for the ground state the symmetric subspace but now the anti symmetric subspace is no longer a single state but it's two states in this case uh so since there are two states sorry uh, let me right so uh, so since there are two states here for the anti symmetric subspace you basically get a um, sort of uh, free evolution for this anti symmetric subspace but again noting here that there are no lindlar jump operators that appear in this equation so this is what i would expect from normal quantum mechanics right and uh, in this case you have three steady states two and uh, two states which are basically dark states as i would call them and the two anti symmetric states that i was talking about that subspace is basically this so psi1 and psi2 are the two anti symmetric states and consequently rho1 and rho2 are the two dark states emerging from this decoherence free subspace uh the problem here becomes a little bit more complicated so the general non equilibrium steady state which emerges from the interaction between the uh you know symmetric subspace and the ground state subspace this you cannot find it uh, analytically except some very special cases uh, this is extremely difficult to find now i would like to just point this out very quickly because uh, in if i look at the literature today dissipative time crystals or time crystals in general seem to be uh, a very interesting and uh, fascinating topic and it seems here in this sort of very simple examples where you have these open systems and where you have these uh, symmetries involved you can have these states which i called rho oc uh, these are emerging from the oscillating coherences so if you remember my plot of the lovellian spectrum there were certain eigen values which had zero real part but finite imaginary part these are exactly the kind of states that emerge here and they come due to this decoherence free subspace and they will basically always oscillate in time and uh, there has been a recent work and i would uh, if you are interested in these time crystals i would uh, definitely encourage you to have a look at this by the group of dita jocks where they looked at these dissipative time crystals and connected them to these oscillating coherences okay um uh, so may i also ask a question here sure please uh, so uh, as everyone mentioned it's very difficult to find all the symmetry operators for your system yes. 
So is the opposite question easier? So could you start with some symmetry operators, construct the system based on that and have multiple steady states? Because um, uh, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier that the, the model was minimal. So yes, is it really absolutely. the minimal model? So, um, okay, well, um, maybe, maybe I should be a little bit more careful when I say something like a minimal model. You're absolutely correct. One could probably take even a two-site model and, and probably do this. Um, the only thing that I, I, was, I was trying to sort of put forth here was the fact that in these kind of very, very simplistic models, I can actually go ahead and find the symmetry operators right from scratch, right from the start, uh, not the reverse construction, right? Um, maybe if I have time towards the end, I will come to one such model where we know the, sort of the symmetry operators. And this is a topologically inter interesting model. It's called the SSH model. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. But uh, in short, yes, you're absolutely right. One can actually do a reverse engineering if one feels like, for sure. Uh, thanks. Just one more question. Could you also have a model where you don't have these pure steady states and instead mixed steady states? Uh, that's actually a very good question. And it's, it, it has some very serious implications. So if you have two states which are non-equilibrium, they could have different transport properties which would mean that uh, you, know, you start in different subspaces and you can get completely different transport properties. Um, unfortunately, we have been trying to search for them for a very long time uh, and we really can't find suitable examples where this would happen. Uh, but yeah, I, I am open to discussing this further with anyone who has ideas on how to go about with this, but this would be definitely very interesting. Uh, uh, hi, uh, this uh, works by uh, Thomas Prozen and others with spin right. chains. Do they find also the two uh, steady states? Or? Yes, they always one. There's always one steady state, and mostly. Uh, so what they do typically is they will work only in the subspace of the steady state. So they they ignore all the decoherence fees, and for obvious reasons, because uh, these are zero current carrying states, they are sort of obvious, so you don't need to go to them. So you directly work in the subspace where you have the non-equilibrium steady state. So uh, they, they to find uh, the steady state is like a pure state. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. So going ahead a little bit. Um, let's, let, me, let me ask the, and again, I think a lot of questions were raised exactly on this point. So I wanna to come to obtaining the non-equilibrium steady states because this is my major interest here, you know? Um, the question that was raised repeatedly was, I need to know the symmetries. I need to know the symmetry operators. And you, all of you are absolutely right. It's extremely difficult to find these. So even if I don't know the symmetry operators, can I construct somehow the non-equilibrium steady states, even from a numerical perspective? I need not get them analytically. And you may... Uh, maybe initially think, yeah, this should be possible, but there is a problem here immediately. So the problem is as follows. Uh, so we are looking at the steady state. So we are looking at the solution where the Lovellian acting on any sort of uh, operator density matrix that is zero. And if rho i's are the steady states, you require these particular properties that they're orthogonal to each other. Now, the problem here is that any linear combination of these rho i's is also a steady state solution. But this need not be a density matrix anymore. So if I do a exact diagonalization, meaning I take a particular system of my interest, create a Lindblad uh, master equation, put it on the computer, get the zero eigenvalues of the Lovellian, and then try to compute or try to uh, use the right eigenvectors as a steady state, I will be in a lot of trouble because this need not be density matrices. So the question is now, how do you construct the density matrices given these rho tilde i's, okay? So rho tilde i's are some linear combination of your density matrices and they're not really density matrices. Um, it's a four or five step process and I think it's pretty much intuitive. So uh, I'll go through each step, but if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, well, step number one, the simplest of it all, you know, the density matrix needs to be Hermitian. So basically make this sort of operator Hermitian. So rho tilde i, 
you just add its dagger to it, which makes the resultant operator a Hermitian operator. You can use a Gram-Schmidt-like orthogonalization procedure, but Gram-Schmidt is typically for vectors. So you have to sort of generalize this for um, matrices and you can do the Gram-Schmidt to ensure that the row O's are all orthogonal to each other. So I have in this kind of a, a framework that I'm considering here, I'm, I'm basically saying I have capital M number of different steady states. This M could be anything. And now all these row one O, row two O, they will all be orthogonal once uh, I, I solve for these. The problem now is that these rho i o's need not be still positive or semi-positive. So you need to do, uh, you need to actually rotate these uh, density matrices in a space where you can make them semi-positive. Now, what I mean by the rotation here. So I'm gonna take a vector, which is basically containing the elements rho i o, and then use the um, SOM group rotational operator to basically rotate this vector. These chi are nothing but the Euler angles. So we learned this with uh, you know two dimensional and three dimensional rotations, what these, um, this rotational matrix is. This is basically coming from an SO, um, SO group. And now you have to generalize it to M dimensions. So with these different Euler angles, the important part is to find the Euler angles at which the density matrices become semi-positive. So uh, I introduced this functional f here, which basically takes the eigenvalues of the density matrix minus its modulus. So by maximizing this functional, meaning, so the maximum value of this functional is zero when all eigenvalues are basically positive. And by maximizing this functional, I will get a set of Euler angles, uh, chi one star, chi two star, so on and so forth which will help me to actually get the semi-positive ortho orthogonal Hermitian matrices. Uh, and that's exactly what I do. I apply this then U of chi star, which is the rotation matrix and get the positive operators. The last thing that remains is the normalization. And this is fairly simple. So you basically divide it by the trace. And it turns out this recipe sort of uh, turn, turns out to be a very good one to actually calculate density matrices from the uh, right eigenvectors corresponding to the zero eigenvalue of the Louisville. So you could in principle have a system in which you don't know the symmetries, put it on the computer, get the eigenvalues, get the eigenvectors and simply construct the density matrices out of it. I just want to note one thing very quickly. If you did not have this sort of a procedure, uh, you would have to rely on the initial condition to actually create the density matrix. But normally we think of the steady state being independent of initial condition. So this recipe that I just presented gets rid of this ambiguity. So there's no longer an initial condition dependence at all. Okay. Um, so Sorry, then, I have one question. Please. So, I mean, basically, I mean, are you saying that these uh, density matrices that you constructed are steady states? These are steady states, exactly. Because I was wondering about the first step. So you make the summation of the, so you make it an Hermitian summing the two. Uh, That's right. Yeah, I, don't know. I was a bit confused because at row IH is a, a, a right eigenstate, right? It, it's, it's a matrix, yes, it's a right eigenstate, but uh, I mean, the yeah. eigenstate represented as a matrix, that's right. So I was wondering whether it's just a mathematical construction or they have also some physical meaning. So it, 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 it seems, it seems um, a bit, I mean, I understand the mathematical construction, but I was wondering right. whether what does it mean? The state okay, so, frame, so. May, maybe, um, okay, so you're physically what is happening is that you have basically got some M operators, all right? Uh, you wanted M density matrices and they are all shuffled in this M dimensional space. Now you need to find the correct rotation, okay? 
in order to get the density matrices, these operators out of it, which are basically semi-positive, Hermitian, and trace one objects. Uh, with, in, in general, this is not true, right? Because if I take a sum of density matrices, the result need not be a density matrix, basically. But that is also a solution or a zero eigenvalue solution of my Lovillian. So I, I don't know whether this really explains any uh, great deep physical insight, but uh, the construction here tends to go stepwise in order to sort of eliminate this problem and rotate things back to a frame in which you actually obtain density matrices. Uh, uh, hi. So uh, is there any reason to expect that you can orthogonalize them uh, because uh, you don't have any orthogonality in the sense for the Lewillian right eigenvector side, so you have by orthogonality. That's right. So uh, do you expect that you can actually, using this procedure, you construct M of the uh, this orthogonal eigenvectors? Uh, so this procedure, is it supposed to work? Yes, I mean, so, okay, so this is, okay, uh, thanks for this question, actually. It's it's a bit more subtle. So um, I think the question is more about the bi-orthogonality of the Lovillian and the orthogonality of the density matrices itself, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so there is a, actually, so if you go back to these, uh, you know, open quantum systems and these Lindblad systems, uh, we have the choice theorem, which basically tells you about the existence of at least one steady state, right? And there you, um, it also proves that these, so this is what I write here by, for example, what I mean by orthogonality of these density matrices. So the trace rho i rho j, this should be zero. And this indeed, uh, you absolutely is a property of the Lindblad uh, generator itself. So um, I do expect that these density matrices are orthogonal to each other. And indeed the procedure should work because otherwise then, I mean, the whole machinery of these open systems sort of starts failing if uh, you don't have that. But please keep in mind that this is not the same as saying that, uh, you know, um, your right eigenvectors need to be all orthogonal to each other. We are just talking about the degenerate subspace of zero yes, eigenvalue. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. Okay. All right. So I think I don't have much time to talk about controlling transport. Uh, Manas, uh, how much time? Maybe two minutes? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so sorry, then let me just quickly go through in the last two minutes about what I can do with these symmetries, right? The simplest thing to do with the symmetry is apply a magnetic field, like what I show you. So you have a system, you apply a magnetic field, the application of the magnetic field breaks the symmetry. So by appropriately breaking symmetries, you can actually then start asking the question, how can I control transport in different systems? Now, this is, was our simple example, apply a magnetic field, it breaks a symmetry, but you can consider more complicated scenarios. So this is basically a left and a right bath, and you have these different rungs here. In this uh, second scenario, it's basically a horizontal sort of uh, ladder. And uh, you have a third scenario where, again, you have a left and a right bath. Now, the top panels are basically the number of non-equilibrium steady states. And in this first case, you can, uh, you can sort of physically expect that I have many permutations in which I can change these different positions of these different rungs and nothing will change. So depending on how many rungs I have, and that's what my number of plackets is on the x-axis, my number of steady states will keep increasing. Uh, I can put different magnetic fields. So I can put a no magnetic field, which are the red curves, a magnetic field along the Z direction or a homogeneous magnetic field, which is everywhere, right? Uh, in the second scenario, if I put a homogeneous magnetic field, I basically break all the symmetries. So there I get a single steady state, which is this green line. Whereas if I put 
a, a magnetic field along the z direction or no magnetic field at all it doesn't matter because you know the z direction magnetic field is not going to change anything since the gradient is already breaking the symmetry in this uh, sort of the the other symmetry in this problem so your number of steady states keeps increasing linearly with the number of rungs because the only symmetry that matters is intra rungs intra placket symmetry okay the inter placket symmetry does not matter whereas in the third case scenario you have depending on the magnetic field the number of steady states completely differs and what this indicates is that you are actually breaking different symmetries in your problem by the application of the magnetic field consequently you have different currents and uh, just to keep in mind you, there is a red line here which is in the presence of zero magnetic field and as i was explaining earlier that uh, there are dark states which are zero current carrying states so the subsector that i'm looking at here is i'm looking at starting with a dark state and that is why starting with a zero magnetic field this dark state is a steady state and you get a zero current but the moment you apply a magnetic field you break these symmetries and consequently you get a finite value of current in these systems okay uh, i think i i have run out so of my time so so Jusa, yes. uh, so yeah, are these like the bond current induced by the magnetic field or like affinity induced current uh, what kind of current this is so sorry this is just particle transport basically. oh this is just the particle transport okay. this is just the particle transport so it's the number of sorry i i uh, put it here but um, yeah it's on this okay, slide okay. so okay. this is just basically the number of particles injected from the left lead minus uh, you know the reverse okay. one okay in the left lead. pumped and dumped okay um, yeah. So uh, maybe I, I uh, just come directly to my summary now and I skip on the SSH model, but if any one of you is interested, I can talk about it at a later time. So uh, let me summarize my talk here. I introduced the notion of symmetries in open quantum systems and showed that these lead to multiple steady states. There were two ideas of symmetries, weak and strong condition for symmetries. The strong condition is always much more easier to find than the weak. And uh, once you know the symmetry operator, analytically calculating the non-equilibrium steady state becomes easier. You find new physics, like you find these oscillating coherences appear. Uh, in case you don't know the symmetries, the problem becomes even more complex, of course. And, but at least computationally, you can have an approach where you can reconstruct these steady states out of the ones that are sort of spit out by your computer. Um, I spoke about how you can break these symmetries using a magnetic field and this helps to control transport. On the last point about the SSH, I was unable to speak about it, but here again, it becomes very interesting because it's not, uh, I mean, it's the position of the leads that actually causes symmetries to appear. So um, if you're interested, I can talk about this later, but with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and stop here, thank you. Um, thank you, Juza, for the very nice talk. Um, so, are there any questions? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. I, uh, may I? Yeah, carry on, carry on. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, so uh, you have these um, uh, dissipation free states which were not so important for you because you're interested in mass in uh, those steady states. But from a uh, point of view of quantum computing, uh, yeah. Those those um, uh, dissipation-free states could be a bonanza, no? Absolutely, they 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 are the I mean uh, quantum I mean quant people working with uh, quantum optics, quantum computation, they love the dark states. So uh, there are several ways of exploiting these dark states, even in these systems. I did I even though I said that uh, it's the NESS. In, in a very sly way, I did exploit the dark state because you know I started in a dark state to get these zero currents. So I used it as well to, to generate these sort of switch kind of behavior where you have a magnetic field and you have a finite current. And when you don't have a magnetic field, you have zero current. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and these have been now, start, people have started exploiting these even for quantum thermodynamics to make batteries. So. Mm there's a lot of interest in these dark states, especially because they are dissipation, uh, sort of decoherence free. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, thank, thank you. you. For this uh, 
And another question, if I may, very quickly. Uh, you, you refer to the difficulties in uh, identifying symmetry operators in a generic system. Right. But it, it seems to me, uh, let's say you, 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 um, uh, uh, your uh, uh, isolated system, the H, the system denoted right. by H, let's say it's, a, it's a some network, some, some graph, uh, some mm -hmm. quantum graph. Then in general, this graph would have a symmetry group that acts on right. it. Uh, Absolutely. And then, then you uh, single out, let's say, uh, some uh, sites for, for the contacts to the, to, the, um, to the two buses. And therefore you would break this bigger group into a smaller, into a smaller group. And then, uh, uh, so, so the smaller group would just uh, act on, on the remaining, uh, on the remaining uh, sites which are not connected with the, with the heat buses. Uh, and it seems to me that that subgroup uh, should, uh, I, I, if you break it into a subgroup, uh, that, that subgroup uh, will be the main tool to identifying Absolutely. all your oper operators. Yes. Have you, have you uh, so, talked? Uh, no, unfortunately not. And you are absolutely correct. So what uh, would be the strategy there would, so again, you're absolutely right. The Hamiltonian, maybe finding a symmetry operator for this is, uh, well, I say simple, but still it has its own complexities, but let's say it's simple. Uh, what we have to make sure then is that the Lindblad jump operator commutes with this symmetry operator. Yes, yes, that's the non-trivial thing. That's the non-trivial thing. And then finding, you know, what is the physical interpretation of such a Lindblad jump operator is the non-trivial part. Mm -hmm. uh, but once that is sorted, you are absolutely correct. This is exactly what should happen. Uh, I haven't looked into it, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we are uh, out of time, uh, running out of time. So uh, if there are any other questions, uh, please contact uh, Juzar. Uh, uh, and um, I think we can go to the next talk. Uh, thanks, Juzar, for the very nice Thank talk. You.